Welcome to another installment of Just One Thing. Today I'm going to give you an overview of Windows Azure tables. My name is Adam Gerholsky and I'm a technical evangelist with RBA Consulting. So tables, what are they? Well, first let's talk about what they are not. Uh, and this is probably one of the most confusing things for people who are first getting acquainted with Windows Azure tables. They are not a relational database. Um, and the name table is confusing, but they're not tables uh, if you're thinking like SQL tables. There aren't any foreign keys, there's no real scheme of validation, uh, but they are called tables. But keep in mind, they are not relational. Um, that's not to say data in tables can't be related, but you are responsible for managing those relationships. You don't have a relational database management system doing it for you. So when it comes to tables, there's really kind of two high-level concepts you need to deal with. The first uh, is tables themselves and what they are. Uh, tables are really nothing more than a store for entities. So what we're talking about here is really an entity data model or an enti entity storage model rather than a relational model. So to help visualize what this looks like, I kind of like to use the following here uh, in terms of uh, to get a gri grip on it conceptually. So it all starts with your storage account, which you set up in the Windows Azure portal. So here we've got the Contoso storage account. This storage account can have multiple tables. So here I've got a customer table and a photos table. These tables have entities in them. Now notice um, a lot of these uh, tables, especially the customer's one, each has a name property, but the one has an email property, another has an email address property. This gets back to that schema uh, challenge I was talking about before, whereas in a relational model, the each entity would have the same shape, the same structure. In this model, not so much. And I'll talk about that just a little bit more here. So when it comes to entities, um, you can kind of think of them as rows, but keep in mind they're not all the same. But an entity can have up to 255 properties. There are a couple mandatory properties, um, a timestamp, um, a row key, which uh, identifies uh, a row within uh, a partition. So you also have to have a partition key. And it's the combination of the partition key and the row key that make a record unique. Now talk about partitioning here just momentarily. Partitioning is a way to give... Uh, data or these tables massive scale so I can partition data off which means the app fabric controller can will take data that's in the same partition and keep it uh, on on one storage node but if data is in another partition it can be moved to a different node that way you get kind of peak performance once again there's really no fixed schema for properties so one entity may have five properties, another may have ten properties. Um, a property could even differ in data type from entity to entity. On one entity, it could be a Boolean. On another, it could be a string. Um, so you really have to keep that in mind, especially when you start versioning your objects uh, in terms of handling those kind of scenarios where maybe one entity doesn't even have a property. So, and I think it, this is really important, this kind of lack of schema. It, it's important enough to, to call out and really illustrate what that means. So let's let's say I have three entities here, uh, and, and we'll call it the, the employee table. Each has a first name, last name. Pretty standard there. But if we look at the third column, or the third property, the birth date, now the entries for both uh, Kim Akers and Nancy Anderson look like fairly typical date-time values. But the, the third one for Mark Asal is actually looks more like a string. And in, in, in the Windows Azure table world, that's fine. There's nothing enforcing that birth date column to be a date. It could be a string as well. Now, additionally, we could also have a favorite sport property, but maybe Nancy is the only one that has that property on her entity, on her record, if you will. So we have to take into account when we're pulling this data out and we're running queries that there could be records where that, that property doesn't even apply. I shouldn't say records, entity where that property doesn't even apply. So we have a very loose schema. And the reason for this is that by not having the constraints that are associated with a traditional relational database system, you get scale at massive, massive levels. These tables are built to scale to meet the needs of something like the next Twitter or Facebook. So that, that's the reason behind this lack of, of uh, schema integrity. So now that you have a really basic idea of what Windows tab Azure tables are, I'm going to show you how to work with them in a demo. So let's get a better understanding of Windows Azure tables by actually working with them. 
what I have here is actually a, con a Windows console application we're going to use to basically create tables and read data and add entries to it. Really simple. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind with Azure tables, as the other Azure storage mechanisms, is that they can be consumed by applications outside of Azure. So standard Windows apps can absolutely use these storage mechanisms. And the reason I'm just using a console application here is so that we can really focus on tables without kind of getting wrapped up in, you know, all the other goo that comes with creating an actual Azure application. So the first thing I need to do is I need to add a reference to a couple of assemblies if I want to work with Azure tables. So let's add a reference here. So first I need to add a reference to the storage client library. This kind of gives me a wrapper for the nice storage abstractions in Azure. So we'll add that. And then I need to work with the data services client library because after all, um, these are actually, these tables actually just kind of are, have a data service sitting in front of them. So we'll add that as well. I think we got it in there. We do. Great. So now what I'm going to do is I actually like to um, do a couple of interesting things here. So let's start by adding just um, an, in, an entity. So an entity, remember, once again, kind of similar to a row. We're just going to do something, a basic message board. Nothing, nothing fancy. So let's add a class. And we'll call this the message board entry. Okay. So first I'm going to clean up our using statements. We only need two here. We just need system and then we need a reference to that storage client library. So there we've got that. The next thing we need to do is inherit from the table service entity class. So let me pop that in. We'll make this class public as well. So this represents kind of the base object in a table service or an, an entity for a Windows Azure table. Next up, I'm going to implement a constructor. So I'm going to do two things in this constructor. You'll notice that because we're inheriting from table service entity, I have a couple of properties. I have a partition key. So this is how where I want how that I want this data group. So in my case, I'm just dating it by kind of a random choice here of month, day, and year, so date, but I could I could choose to keep all of this data in the same partition if I wanted to, or I can spread it out across multiple partitions. In this case, um, each, each day would get its own partition. The next thing I need is a row key. So here I'm just kind of creating a, a very unique value using some date, time, and quid values. And it's the combination of this partition key and row key that make an entry unique. A row key makes this entity unique within its partition, but it's the partition key and row key that make the entity unique across all entities, across all partitions. Now remember when I was talking about um, required properties, there's also a timestamp property. I don't need to do anything with this. Windows Azure will take care of it for me, but it's there if you want to look at it. So now that I've got this taken care of, let's just add a couple properties here. I'm just going to add two string properties. So we have a username and a message. And that's all I need for this. So let's get out of here, clean that up real quick. Make sure we build. It's good. So let's move on to our next class. So the next thing I want to do is I want to create just a basic data context that I can use to query objects in this table. So I'm going to add another class. And this one I'll call the message board data context. Once again, I'll drop in the appropriate using statements. And now in this case, I'm going to inherit from the table service context itself. Following that, all I need to do is add just two things here and I'll drop these in, just a constructor. And then You'll see here, so I have a constructor which just takes the base address, that's the address of the table, and then the credentials used to access the table. And then just an iQueryable of the ent of the entity I'll be working with. So the message board entry, which ties back to that class we just created. So that looks good. Let's build this. And now let's do one more thing, and that's I like to create kind of abstract my data access when working with tables. So I like to create another class called the message board data source class. And this will give me the methods, uh, kind of wrap the methods to add and get records. So let's add the class. Message board data source looks good. 
Once again, we'll just bring in the using statements we need. In this case, since this is just my own class, I don't need to inherit anything. Once again, I'm just wrapping some calls to make it a little bit easier. So let's add a couple of member properties here. So just my storage account that I'll be using to get uh, where this table is going to reside, and then the data context itself. A couple of constructors, one static, one public, one instance-based, I should say. So in the static constructor, all I'm doing is getting the storage account. In the case for this demo, I'm just using the development storage account on my local machine. I could replace that with an actual account up in Azure as well. And then the next thing I do is create tables from the model. So this is going to create a table based on the message board entry. Next, And then in the actual instance constructor as well, I, I create a new context. So that's this class here, this data or this data context class. And I set a retry policy. So if something fails, it'll retry in this case three times. Now all I need are the methods to um, get and add entries to the table. So let's look at adding first. Very simple. If you've worked with kind of WCF data services, look should look pretty familiar. All I do is I, or even entity framework, this will look familiar to you. I just simply add a, an object to my context. So in this case, I say the message board entry. That's the table I'm working with. And then the item, which just comes in as a parameter. Then, of course, I have to call save changes. Failing to do that will not persist your changes. And then to get messages, I can just use some standard link syntax here. So from my context, from the message board entry, just in this case, I'm selecting them all. Of course, I could filter by partition. I could filter by name, etc. Here, I'm just going to pull them all back, and I return the results. So really no magic there. If you're used to working with link things like Entity Framework or WCF Data Services, this should look pretty familiar, pretty comfortable to you. Last thing we need to do is actually go through and start working with this data. So what I want to do in my main method here is first I want to capture a couple of in inputs. So I want a username and uh, a message that I will then use to create a new message board entry. So here just console, give me the username, give me the message, then I create a new entry. I'll then instantiate my data source and just call add message, passing in that message I just created. And then the next thing I want to do is I want to iterate all the messages in the table. So I'll just drop this code in here. Pretty simple, very simple to do. So let's run this, see what happens, make sure we build, of course. We build, and let's run. Move this over to my screen here, so I'll enter my name, Adam. My message, hello, Azure Tables. I'll take a minute here because it has to actually go through create the tables you'll see here. Then it actually read that data from the tables. So to verify what happened, I can also go into Visual Studio and go to my server explorer. And you'll see there's a node for Windows Azure storage in my development environment. I can look at my tables. Can take a minute or two to, to, uh, to expand here. One thing to keep in mind too, you can also hook this up to um, to an actual Azure account, but of course, as you're viewing this data, because data is technically leaving the data center, each click could be considered a charge. So I'll just click View Table, and I should see my row in here. Take a minute, not a minute, but a few seconds, and there we go. So there's my partition key, the date, the row key, just that random value timestamp, my message, and my username. So pretty simple to start working with Azure Tables. So as you see, working with Windows Azure Tables is pretty easy and straightforward to do. Of course, you know, you don't have that nice integrity, the, the schema management that you get from a relational data model. Um, but what you get with that, you get a couple of things. First of all, you get um, great scalability. Um, you also get a significantly reduced price. So uh, SQL Azure will cost you approximately $10 per gig per month uh, for storage. Windows Azure Tables cost you 15 cents per gig per month. So given that, you know, huge price savings you can get with Azure Tables, it's often beneficial to look at the data models you're going to be moving to the cloud and figuring out are there pieces that it makes more sense to run in Azure Table Storage, both from kind of a scalability perspective and cost perspective. So something to definitely keep in mind as you consider your data models uh, when moving to the cloud. And that's it for today.